My question is on the topic of the justification of Abraham. Uh-huh. It's not specifically on whether, you know, if he was, if it was by faith alone or by works. I know they appeal to passages in, like, Romans 2, verses 6 to 7, to try and defend justification, like, plus works. But um, my question is on, you know, the number of times Abraham was justified. And uh, the Roman Catholic apologist that I've been engaging with, I, I, not very popular, you probably haven't heard of him, but... Um, he basically appealed to Hebrews 11, verse 8, in order to support the idea that Abraham was justified or had faith in uh, Genesis 12, and that Genesis 15 and Genesis 22 are just like other times he was justified to try to support the Roman Catholic beyond the issue. So yep. I wanted to be like, what are your thoughts on like yep. Hebrews 11, verse 8? Is that, you know, what yep. are your thoughts on? Yeah, uh, extensive section on this argument in The God Who Justifies, uh, for those who have my book on the Doctrine of Justification. It is a a common form of argumentation, and it is, to me anyways, indicative of where Roman Catholicism is in that it is arguing against Paul's own point in Romans chapter 4. First of all, a couple things to keep in mind on just simply the factual level. Yes, Hebrews talks about Abraham as a man of, actually Abram at that point as a man of faith, but what's interesting is the first use of the word faith in Genesis is not in chapter 12, it's in chapter 15. And Genesis 15, 6, Abram believed God and it was reckoned him as righteousness, is the second most often quoted text from the Old Testament in the New Testament. The most often is Psalm 110, 1. And so the second most often is Genesis 15, 6. So let me just make sure people understand what the argument is. In Roman Catholicism, you can be justified multiple times. Justification is a state that is actually dependent upon... Now, this is an old, older, more orthodox uh, Roman Catholic doctrine going back to the Council of Trent. Uh, It's important, I think, to note that I don't think that the current pope would hold any of these views. (laughs) I just, just don't... I just don't think that he would. I doubt that he would find this to be a useful conversation. I think he's a universalist, and so all of this stuff wouldn't be overly relevant. But more orthodox, historical Roman Catholics and Roman Catholic apologists, and and like the people you're dealing with, will make the argument that Abram was justified minimally three times. Because in Roman Catholicism, you can be justified, then lose your status of justification through the commission of a mortal sin, and then have to be re-justified. Now, how Abraham was able to do this without a priesthood, without sacraments, without any of these things, and without it ever being mentioned in Scripture, is a difficult thing to begin to comprehend. And the idea of Abram regularly committing mortal sins is likewise something that you would think might be mentioned somewhere in the narrative, speaking of him, I would just simply suggest to you, the Apostle Paul has no concept of venial mortal sin distinctions, destructions of the state of grace by mortal sin, any of that stuff that is plainly post-apostolic development. Uh, It's not apostolic. It doesn't come from the Apostles. It doesn't come from the New Testament. So the argument, though, is that initially in Genesis 12, when Abram obeys and leaves Ur of the Chaldees, that this has to be an act of faith, and therefore it has to have been justifying faith. And so he's justified in Genesis 12, even though Paul never says that. Then he's justified again. So something happens between Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 to where he loses the state of justification. He's committed a mortal sin. He is then re-justified in Genesis 15. And then is justified again in Genesis chapter 22 in the offering of Isaac on the altar. And so that's based on James 2, by the way. Three different places where where Abraham is justified. So here's the problem with with all of that. As I said, uh, faith is, for the first time, is used in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Secondly, if you look at what happens in Genesis 15, a covenant is made. Remember the, the cutting of the animals, the torch passing through... Uh, everything that takes that takes place there. A promise is given in Genesis 12. There's no question about that. But the idea of faith in response to a covenantal promise is picked up by the Apostle Paul 
and made the point of Abram's justification in Romans chapters 3 and 4, specifically chapter 4. So, if Abram is justified multiple times before and after circumcision, this becomes an argument against Paul's own position in Romans chapter 4. Let me show you why. We recognize the centrality of this to his argument in chapter 4. It says, What then shall we say that Abram, our father, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's Genesis 15, 6. Now, if he had been justified before, why doesn't he quote from Genesis 12? If he's justified later, why doesn't he quote from Genesis chapter 22? These are, are relevant questions because Paul is engaged in an argument here, and he's engaged in an argument against Judaizers. This is the foundation of how Paul is going to be defending his gospel, and he's been defending his gospel against Judaizers for quite some time. So they know the Old Testament text just as well, probably better than most of us today do. So if, if he's focusing on Genesis 15, 6, it needs to be defensible. For what does the Scripture say? Abram believed God and it was credited him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. And so it's a 180-degree contrast. You have the person who works and the person not working. The person who works, his wage is is not considered to be a gift or grace, but, but it's a debt, what is owed to him. But to the one not working, but instead believing, connected directly back to Genesis 15, 6, his faith is credited as righteousness. So here's where righteousness is coming from. It's from a faith that is in God, that is not seeking to get something from God, to fulfill some kind of conditions. It's the empty hand of faith. The only the empty hand of faith that can grasp the hand of grace. Then he says, just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Now, it's fascinating that, that here Paul says, here's the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness. So this, this is an imputation. It's the term legizitai. Legizomai is the Greek term for imputation. Here's where imputation of righteousness. This is something Rome denies, but here it is directly in the text. God reckons, imputes righteousness, chorus ergon, apart from works, without the addition of or the medium of works. And then what's interesting is when he quotes from the Psalms, Psalm 32, what you find in the Psalm is the negative of what Paul says. So in other words, it's Paul says this is God crediting righteousness apart from works. But here are the words. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. So notice it is non-imputation of sin in Romans 4, 7, and 8 that Paul sees as being the necessary scriptural foundation of the positive crediting of righteousness that's found in verse 6. Interesting apostolic interpretation. And again, uh, the Jewish person is going to argue against this. And if you want to see, there are Jewish rabbis on YouTube right now that will argue with this very text, and you can go look them up. Uh, so he, he's going to have to substantiate what he's just said, but notice what he says. Blesses the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Now, what I would suggest to you, I don't know if you've gotten to this, Matt, but if you're talking with Roman Catholic apologists, I have asked them many, many times, who is the blessed man of Romans 4 8? Who is the blessed man? And a Roman Catholic cannot answer that question meaningfully. When I asked Dr. Peter Stravinskis, a man with two PhDs from Ivy League, League schools, a Roman Catholic priest. Actually, it's a Byzantine right, uh, priest, but same thing. A Roman Catholic priest, when I asked him, who is the blessed man of Romans 4.8, his initial response was Jesus. So Jesus is blessed because the Lord will not count Jesus' sin against him. Nah, I don't think so. So I gave him the opportunity of rethinking that. And so the second answer he came up with was, well, I hope to be that man. <laughs> 
I hope to be that man. Well, here's the problem. In Paul's argument in Romans 4, every believer is the blessed man. Every Christian is the blessed man in Romans 4, 8. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. That's what it means to be a Christian, is that by faith in Christ, you receive his righteousness and your sin is imputed to him. The Roman Catholic has no non-imputation of sin, therefore there is no blessed man. That's what's important to keep in mind. Now, here is the key. Then notice what Paul says. Is this blessing then on the, on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Now, please note something. The apostle, in defining this issue for Christians, Genesis 12, but on Genesis 15, and the apostle looks at this in a temporal situation, a temporal context. What do I mean by that? Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say faith is credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited, verse 10, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? So, right there you have the utilization in the language of time. And it's asking the question, was he credited this righteousness while circumcised or uncircumcised? Now, the only way you can, we can understand that is Paul is saying that righteousness came to Abraham at a point in time in his life. It's something, and this is, becomes foundational to Romans 5.1, therefore having been justified by, by faith, we have peace with God. It's something we look back upon. That's the Christian experience. In Abraham, he likewise had an, a, a point of justification that he can look back upon, and Paul can ask the question, was he, when he was justified, circumcised or uncircumcised? If he was justified multiple times, Paul's question is stupid. It makes no sense. So if you posit multiple justifications, Paul's teaching in Genesis 12, 15, 22, you just refuted his own argument because he's asking a question and he answers the question. He says, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. So without a doubt in Paul's mind, he was not justified while circumcised. So there goes Genesis 22. So the third of the three, that one's out because Paul's just said it. And then which verse does he cite as the point of justification? Genesis 15. So that's Paul's argument. And so when someone comes along and says, well, Paul was justified again in Genesis 22, they're contradicting Paul. They say he was justified before in Genesis They're contradicting Paul. They are taking apart the apostolic argument that becomes the foundation of all the rest of chapter 4. And then into chapter 5, where he says, we have been justified. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and then that uh, takes us into the whole discussion of Adam and the federal headship and everything that follows from there. So, as popular as this argument is, it demonstrates that those promoting it are not individuals that are walking through Romans 4 and following the argument. They have, well, Rome denies sola scriptura, so they don't have to do that. They have a theology that is provided by another source of authority anyways, and so it's like pointing out that Rome's doctrine of Mary is, is not based on, on any exegesis of Scripture. It it's, has far more influence from pseudo-Gnostic Gospels of the second century than it does from biblical exegesis. So they don't have the same strictures we have as far as exegesis is concerned, but that also leads to misrepresentation of the text. So there you go.